Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's show. My name is Spencer Wells. Thank you so much for joining us here today. No, the voice is a little weird. No, I want to clear that throat, but we are here with you today and all throughout the week, giving you everything you need to know. Full schedule of shows, part two of the Hidden History episode on Guatemala, coming out for you on Friday. It's going to be a packed week, but thank you so much for being a part of it. Here is where we start today. Ukraine may have begun their counteroffensive into Russia, their long promised, long planned, long proposed counteroffensive. Um, and it is going to be a pretty big deal. We'll take a look at some of the early targets that they're hitting and the odds for success. Give you everything you need to know on that. Also, round two of legal troubles for Trump. We will touch on that quickly as ex- the ex president's lawyers are complaining about his perceived misconduct in the handling of, uh, or not Donald Trump's perceived misconduct, but lawyers' perceived misconduct in regards to the handling of documents and obstruction of access to said documents by the government. Also, Mike Pence and Cornell West, of all people, have announced their presidential runs on the same day today. And a pretty cool story out of Mexican electoral politics. Uh, probably the most successful world leader right now that you've ever heard of. And he's on the left doing pretty well with another major win over the weekend. Yeah, hopefully the voice, uh, you know, isn't... Uh, Throwing you off the the coverage here because I know you know if I tune in to hear someone you know they were talking like the way I'm talking right now it may be a little bit perturbing but um, do appreciate you sticking with us today because the coverage the breakdowns and the analysis will not be any less bad as you may have been able to tell I've been definitely quite congested uh, throughout the last couple of weeks in regards to allergies and things like that so that has been a pretty consistent problem. Of, uh, so hopefully it's looking, it's going to get a little bit better over the next few weeks. So anyways, though, we got, we got a very big, big, big uh, news coming in today to talk about. And that is the long awaited beginning of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. As you know, the first thing I got in this morning um, was they are targeting now more and striking more in a kind of uptick and surges. Something that the U.S. has said is the Ukrainian counteroffensive. So I think it's pretty much safe to say, you know, they don't want to advertise it as much. I've seen some some uh, media from the Department of Defense in Ukraine saying you know, plans love silence was there was the uh, slogan that they went with. So essentially saying, that, you know, keep it quiet if you are in Ukraine, I guess, and you, do, you shouldn't be posting about it. But, um, you know, the mainstream media for a lot of this conflict has been the last people to report um, actions that Ukraine takes that it's pretty clear to everyone else when you're looking at the situation like you know you know that you took that okay so it's like it's, it's pretty clear uh, what happened there but let's get to the New York Times on this so Ukrainian forces have stepped up artillery strikes and ground assaults in a flurry of military activity that American officials suggested on Monday could signal that Kiev's long planned counteroffensive against Russia has begun The fighting, which began on Sunday, was raging along several points along the front line, but to the east of where many analysts expected Ukraine's counteroffensive to begin. So it could be a good sign, meaning that they've gotten uh, further than they may have expected. Um, What they're trying to do is allow Kiev's troops to kind of head south towards the Sea of Azov and cut the land bridge connecting occupied Crimea to mainland Russia. Um, So if they were able to do that, kind of cut off the um, this land bridge connecting Crimea to mainland Russia and really be able to take back Crimea, that would be something that would be essentially beyond wildest Ukrainian dreams. Crimea was essentially, you know, in all reality, um, you know, despite obviously what should be, you know, taking out, you know, what should be, you know, you had to look at what is. Uh, prior to the war, Ukraine, or sorry, Crimea was essentially settled Russian territory. You know, Ukraine wasn't really contesting it in any serious way. Um, you know, you can talk for ages about the illegitimacy of Ukraine 
um, having that annex from them uh, by Russia in 2014. But I have to say, you know, I have to say, like, let's be real. This was not under serious contention until the war began. And if it was to fall, um, it would be a serious, perhaps, um, you know, it would be a great punishment, I think, for and probably the ultimate humiliation short of, you know, Ukrainian troops rolling into the Kremlin and, you know, arresting Vladimir Putin and hanging him in front of the world, you know, to lose the um, Crimean Peninsula um, and lose control of the Crimean Peninsula after regaining it so easily and so so clearly in 2014 um, was is an incredible, incredible humiliation and something that absolutely nobody expected to start. Um, you know, no one expected when the war started that it would end this way. So it was, at, you know, if it were to to happen, you know, and as I was not to say, it will happen. You know, Russia is still, you know, not going to go down without a fight here. But wow, uh, if that were to have anything close to happening, it would be absolutely incredible. The Russian Ministry of Defense said on Monday that a major Ukrainian operation had begun at five locations in the eastern Donetsk region. So it's kind of the bottom, uh, sorry, southeastern corner, essentially of Ukraine, and then it repelled the assaults inflicted on Ukrainian forces. Uh, Moscow's report cannot be independently corroborated. Uh, Ukrainian's Deputy Defense Minister, Hanna Myler, said on the Telegram messaging app that Kiev's forces were moving to offensive actions, continuing a defense that began when Russia invaded its neighbor 15 months ago. A defensive operation includes everything, including counter-offensive actions. So, again, this is something that it would be um, it would be really a remarkable uh, kind of turn of phrase from the Ukrainians here saying that, you know, if we're we're just doing counter offense and that still qualifies under the umbrella of a defensive operation, because if you're <laughs> the Ukrainians here who have kind of like long been operating under the perception of um They've long been operating with the perception of we are just trying to fight off big bad Russia coming in, trying to take off our entire country, destroy our democracy, et cetera, et cetera, which is an incredibly noble goal. Um, but if certain forces in Ukrainian government, perhaps, you know, does Zelensky have control over them? Uh, does he not? I think that's a pretty open question. Um, you know, the, the various oligarchs, the various power centers, especially in kind of the eastern parts of Ukraine, if they have gotten to him to kind of, or, you know, influence him to say, uh, we need to keep going on this. We can't just, you know, leave things as is, um, you know, with maybe, you know, pre-March 2022 borders minus Crimea, you know, or maybe even or, or plus Crimea, excuse me, like, you know, and we need to go even further. That's, you know, a whole other thing. And again, what type of counteroffensive operations is um Hannah Hanna Malyar, the Ukrainian deputy defense minister, talking about? I think that is a very interesting question. If I were the U.S., you know, I'm sure they know. I'm sure they're, you know, tapping phones, you know, because as we've seen, that is, you know, they've, they've already, it's already been proven that they've done that to Zelensky, uh, you know. And for once, it's, it's probably a pretty good thing they're tapping phones because Ukraine has shown a fundamental unwillingness, you know, and would I do this if I were in their position? You know, maybe I would. Probably, it, it pr- probably would make sense just to say to not keep the U.S. oppressed at all of what is going on, of, you know, of what they're planning to do um, and really just allowing um, these kind of counteroffensive operations, these... Uh, this this Belgorod excursion, this bombing on the outskirts of Moscow, the the freaking crazy Kremlin drone strike that took place recently. Um, so it really does kind of show you that um, it really does kind of show you that they are moving towards a more aggressive, possibly counteroffensive slash offensive pitch. And you know, this is this is uh, one of the one of the crazier kind of times in the war where it seems like it, that very well could be possible. Um, but the question is now, how do we as Americans and people, you know, who, how do the people in control of American policy uh, react in this situation? You know, is it something that, you know, like many have long suspected kind of as a, you know, as a great power conflict, will we use Ukraine as a lever in the great power conflict to push them maybe when, it is kind of incentivized, especially if they retake Crimea. That's the point where you, you know, okay, let's go to the negotiating table here. Um, 
if Russia is, of course, you know, willing and obviously acting in good faith, but it's very possible you could see the United States as well say, um, you know, it's either one of two scenarios, again, from the U.S. perspective, knowing or unknowing, um, encouraging or just kind of being the wool pulled over their eyes. And I would have to bet um, it would be the encouraging side because, um, again, we have seen the United States almost at certain times spell it out, some certain U.S. officials spell out the fact that we are supporting Ukraine to damage Russia as a great power that is going to be opposed to us and could be less powerful in alliance with China, et cetera, et cetera. So will we push them to go further than may be in their interests, or will we push for peace? My bet is we will push them to go further. And there's some of this F-16s, some of the F-16s going over to Ukraine, um, and some of the other weapons that we are getting assurances of now will not be used to strike inside Russia. You know, I'm, I suspect, like most things regarding Ukraine and giving them weapons, the rules will be eventually bent until they are broken. Um, just a little thought from you there, but uh, you, you don't know. Um, it'll be very interesting, of course, all dependent on the Ukrainian counteroffensive and how things will respond. Um, Ukraine said it, it will make no formal announcement about the start of the counter-offensive. Uh, and Ukrainian officials have apparently not told their American counterparts exactly when the battle would start. So it goes to kind of counter counter to the thing that they're in coordination. Um, and you, the U.S. is egging them on. You know, I'm sure the U.S. has some idea of what they're doing. You know, it's, it's clear the Ukrainians aren't telling the U.S. what they're doing. Um, and I'm sure the U.S. has some idea through, you know, ul- ulterior methods. Um, but... I do think that at the end of the day, the United States knows but doesn't care and would like to see the Ukrainians continue to push, push, push as much as they can. So American officials partly based their assessment that Kiev's counteroffensive had likely begun on, on information gleaned from U.S. military satellites, which detected increased movement within Ukrainian military positions. Uh, the satellites have infrared capabilities to track artillery fire and missile launches. U.S. military analysts also said they believe Ukrainian units were making an initial push to determine the positions and strength of Russia's forces, a traditional tactic that Americans have been training Ukrainian forces to use. Um, so, yeah, so it seems like we're kind of in the initial push stage at this point. An American official said that this testing for potential weaknesses in Russian defenses, manpower, and morale, um, what the U.S. military calls reconnaissance by force, would likely continue for several days. Uh, if successful, then the main fr- thrust of the counteroffensive, which would be obviously more evident, would begin. So, again, some reporting there from New York Times. Let's go to our next story. MC, make another hit. Whoa! This ain't what you want. Project, project, this ain't what you want. This ain't what you want. You're listening to News Flash right here on the Spencer Walsh Radio Network. Help us grow our audience. Subscribe, rate, and review our show on whatever podcast platform you're listening on. Thank you very much. You are listening to News Flash on the Spencer Walsh Radio Network. I hope you're enjoying a good start to your summer, a good start to the month of June. We are officially halfway through 2023. What a crazy i really feel like this this beginning of this year has uh flown by quite quite fast um yeah just blink and it is already um is already june or halfway through pretty crazy all right with that being said it is time to move on to our next story and that regards the former president donald trump as lawyers for trump and with this is here in The Guardian. Um, met with top U.S. Justice Department officials on Thursday to complain about perceived misconduct in the criminal investigation into the former U.S. president's handling of national security materials and obstruction, uh, according to two people familiar with the matter. So the meeting involved Trump lawyers Jim Trusty, <laughs> John Raleigh, and Lindsey uh, Halligan speaking with the special counsel, Jack Smith, who is leading the investigation, a senior career official to the deputy attorney general, one person said. Um, so they are making the case that there is some, apparently some fishy stuff going on, um, making a general case in the Mar-a-Lago, uh, as to why Trump should not be charged in the Mar-a-Lago documents case and suggesting that some prosecutors working under special counsel Jack Smith engage in what they consider prosecutorial misconduct, the people said. The exact allegations are not clear, but 
Trump's lawyers have claimed for weeks, um, they, specifically around Jay Bratt. This is one of their biggest focuses of their complaints. He is the chief of the counterintelligence and espionage section at the Justice Department. One sought to induce a witness into confirming some things they declined to one of the people said. So something you're not supposed to do there. Um, again, this is probably uh, this is probably the most next, and I would say probably next least severe um, legal thing to come towards Trump in the wake of the thing he was indicted for in New York. With this, it took me a minute actually. It blanked for a brief minute on what. It was, it was the Stormy Daniels hush money payments. Oh my God, remember that. Um, It was really mainly just a spectacle and nothing to, nothing much more than that. But he was, it was kind of the first charge, probably the least severe charge. I'd say this is probably the one that's likely to come out, um, you know, most likely to come out next. And is also, again, probably the next least severe charge on this, um, in my opinion, Because, let's face it, you know, we're looking at some documents. We don't really know what the documents are. It could be anything. And I think for this to, like, really land with people, I mean, I don't think you can get, like, people aren't, maybe I get, like, in the 1970s and, like, the water gauge, you know, people would have been really, you know, worked up about documents and it, but in the era of just where so many politicians have done so many crazy things the idea that I think you'll get a lot of people especially you know Republican primary voters or anything like that or just the general country at large frankly to care that Trump kept unnamed documents from the White House longer than they should have you know, um, I think it's kind of hard to imagine it's just going to be very, very hard, again, in my opinion, to get people worked up about this because it's just, it's just documents. Like, he, he, get, he didn't do anything with documents. He kept them in his house, and he looked at them, at least apparently according to all these allegations. You know, if we were able to, on the Democratic side, if they were able to, like, find some, you know, juicy details about specifically what documents they were and maybe you know, hint at plans he may have had to do with them, that would be a more interesting story. But in terms of a indictment that, you know, kind of carries weight and, I mean, something in the court, court of public opinion, which really does take hold because, again, he's running for election here. So the court of public opinion does kind of play a pretty major role, um, you know, especially if this legal case becomes a scenario that kind of gets dragged out for years and years and years, which, you know, knowing Trump, it probably will because he's obviously a very wealthy guy. Um you know, the court of public opinion does matter a lot, and if these do- if these documents continue to stay completely just unnamed, completely just blank piece of paper, you know, kind of in the American mind, it's going to be a bit of a problem. So they're meeting for this in this situation, probably just essentially trying to talk his ear off, say, "Oh, this is all BS, BS, BS," but. The development comes, according to The Guardian here, the development comes as prosecutors have recently asked witnesses before the grand jury hearing evidence in the case uh, in Washington, whether Trump showed off national security materials, including a document concerning military action against Iran, uh, people close to the case said. So, again, what was he going to do with these? Like, you know, just frame them and look at them in his apartment and all that, you know, in, in, in Mar-a-Lago all day? You know, if that's all it is, I have, again, a very hard time imagining very many people caring too much about this. Um, But it'll be interesting to see what happened uh, and what will happen down the road. All right, let's move on now to our next story where former Vice President Mike Pence filed paperwork on Monday declaring his presidential candidacy, marking a long shot on a long shot campaign against the former president he served under, Donald J. Trump. You know, not a very good sign, at least for Trump on, on paper, to have your vice president running against you. It just shows how, you know, the ticket has failed. But again, it is not a normal time, you know, and Trump obviously would never have run with Pence again because of the fact, you know, how it ended in 2020 with the uh, hang Mike Pence chants echoing throughout the Capitol on January 6th. And, you know, where does that leave Pence? Well, he has just filed in New York Times, Maggie Haverman on this story. Um, 
Mr. Pence just filed the necessary papers to run with the Federal Election Commission, has polled in the single digits in every public survey so far, well behind Trump, who has reshaped the Republican Party over the last seven years. The former vice president is expected to formally announce his campaign at a rally outside Des Moines, Iowa, a day after Chris Christie is expected to enter the race. And this is a pretty, pretty good one. Governor Doug Burgum of North Dakota did not know who this guy is. No idea why he's running whatsoever. I mean, it is, it's pretty shocking. Like, what is, I guess it's just publicity. You can try and run for Senate later. You know, like, I don't know exactly what this is. Um, maybe he's running for some sort of cabinet position. Have literally never heard of him before. And when there's a politician I haven't heard of, it is a pretty big deal because I know, I'm a pretty big nerd about this kind of stuff. I don't know if you've been able to tell. But, uh, Pence is campaigning to campaign, Candy planning to campaign extensively in Iowa, the first nominating state in a place where its hard like conservative positions on issues like abortion could appeal to evangelical voters. Advisors to Pence, a former governor of Indiana, see Iowa as geographically hospitable to the brand of conservatism he practiced before the Trump era, and he is making that bet that enough vestiges of the old Republican Party remain to give his message broad appeal. Um, Pence, whom the celebrity assessed Trump used to refer to as, quote, out of the central casting, was a stalwart supporter and defender of Trump over the latter half of the 2016 presidential campaign as his running mate at a time where Pence was facing a difficult re-election effort in Indiana. He was Trump's most loyal advocate throughout their time in office together, but when Trump began a pressure campaign on Pence to thwart Joe Biden's electoral college victory after being certified after Biden, uh, Trump lost the 2020 election, Pence refused his to use, use his ceremonial role overseeing the certification at the Capitol on January 6th to advance Trump's aims. So that's, you know, the kind of history that we all know, but the question is, where does this leave Trump now, uh, Pence now? You know, by pretty much all accounts, the only really role that he could play is be a s- spoiler for Ron DeSantis in Iowa. So Ron DeSantis is always kind of already doing the kind of, you know, loser move that we've only seen work very, very few times, which is essentially campaign hard, hard, hard in the early states and try and steal some of that early momentum away from the clear and obvious front runner. Um, the fact that Trump, or sorry, the, the fact that Pence is doing this too, uh, kind of shows that, and so not just Pence, Haley, you know, a bunch of others, you know, the kind of uh, single digiters down there um, are kind of continuing to kind of do this. Strategy two only really looked badly for Ron DeSantis. You know, this is another one of these campaigns where it's kind of hard to see, you know, what political future Mike Pence has in, in, in store in terms of, yes, he did run for president. Yes, he, or, or yes, he, or yes, he is running for president. He already was vice president. He's been, uh, I believe, a house, house rep and possibly, you know, some, some, sent, some representative from Indiana, at least for a pretty long period of time. Um, and that, so, again, he was speaking on the, the House floor after like 9-11. So he's been around for quite a long time. Um, so it's not like he's got, you know, a big, bright future ahead of him. I don't know anything about, you know, Doug Burgum. I can't, don't know how to compare that to. So it's not like he's just you know, doing it to kind of get his name out there, like, you know, Pete Buttigieg or some sort of person like that, you know, a fellow Hoosier. But um, he really is, you know, if you look at the first few states, the first early states, um, it really seems like he does not have that many. All right, because if, you, if you're looking at Iowa, it's like the first, when the first few state strategy already being done by Ron DeSantis. And if you're looking at, Iowa, I'd say polls right now, not too different from the national picture from what I've seen over that subject to change. Um, you know, Mike Pence, I would say, would probably have to win or, or do do a really good job, do a really impressive campaign. Something really drastic would have had to happen uh, to Ron DeSantis. But the only real role he can play in Iowa, and he could play this role, you know, more strongly in Iowa as opposed to, you know, somewhere else, say, like maybe South Carolina or something like that. But he really would just be a spoiler to Ron DeSantis because Ron DeSantis is also trying to do the same thing, which is win Iowa, season momentum, carry it into New Hampshire, carry it into South Carolina, get the next early states going and, you know, just get the momentum going by winning those early states and just taking away that image of Trump as the winner, as the, you know, anointed one, as the anointed nominee and, you know, actually make things 
a little interesting. Um, because if you were to, to really run away with it, wins the first two, three, four states, it's over, especially with the lead that he already has. So Ron DeSantis, his whole thing is, as we've discussed on the show, we're going to Iowa. We're going to push, push, push hard in Iowa. We're going to hire people to knock doors for us. Um, and if DeSantis is doing that and probably has, you know, at the highest end, 10% from Mike Pence to contend with and maybe, you know, like 5 to zero from like five to six other people it's gonna be really really tough for him to do anything other than just spoil ron DeSantis's push um against president trump so maybe he's trying to get back on president trump's good side you know that certainly would help by just you know killing the DeSantis campaign in in the in the cradle but it would be pretty hard to see how this helps anyone but donald trump it's not gonna help mike pence you know with winning that's for sure and it's really hard to see where pence goes after this so it's pretty weird but he's not the only one who has jumped in the race. A pretty controversial uh, decision, especially on some parts of uh, the Twitter circles where I, you know, poke my nose into. Uh, Cornell West, the progressive activist and professor, uh, b- former Bernie surrogate, um, is running for president on the People's Party platform, uh, which is going to be pretty interesting to say the least. Um, the People's Party has been a, a essentially, you know, let's be honest, it's been a joke party. It's been a third party that kind of. S- uh, struck up, uh, I think around like 2018, in between the two Bernie Sanders runs, um, to just be like, you know, Democratic Party has failed. We need to create a third party to challenge it. We can't take it over from the outside. It's, it's hopeless, essentially. Um, when you know, taking it over, taking the Democratic Party over, quote unquote, you know, can say a lot about that strategy. You could, it's it's you know being very unlikely, impossible, whatever. You know, they're, but. You know, and there needs to be a third way, which I would happen to agree with. But, you know, there has been no other electoral third way. You know, I think probably the best, quote unquote, third way outside the Democratic Party is to influence the Democratic Party through, you know, what DSA is doing. Um, and also you know, through stronger labor power to just, you know, really influence again on the side of these Democratic members who can be very, very, you know, malleable, can be convinced on specific issues by an organized, active labor base. But other than that, you know, electorally, there has been obviously no clear thing that's emerged. The People's Party is one of them, one of the attempts, um, and it has been pretty, you know, thoroughly discredited. They haven't run really anyone, I don't think. Uh, They definitely haven't won any successful elections. So this essentially is a publicity stunt by uh, Cornell West, just kind of get his name out there. But... It comes at a time where Joe Biden is essentially given the glide path to the nomination. There aren't really any, you know, satisfying challengers. You know, Marion Williamson is no person that we need to be going up against um, Joe Biden. And the best kind of standard bearer of the left in order to kind of unite what is a very fractured coalition in the way um, that Bernie Sanders did. He's, she is definitely not that person. RFK Jr. is a joke. Um, you know, kind of anti-vaxxer, just, you know, and who won't even stand up against Israel polling at 6 or 7%. Like, if there's any time we're irrelevant enough to, you know, take a, what could be a dangerous stand for you politically, like, this is the time to do it. And he couldn't even do that. So, there, and of course, you know, people are dying for anybody other than Biden or Trump in 2024. They're literally calling out, crying for it, you know, screaming for it. Um, so, you know, to have Cornell West in the race, you know, making waves, you know, probably getting very little attention, but at least getting some attention, I I personally don't think is a bad thing. You know, it, it is disappointing to see he's doing it on the People's Party, maybe not doing another kind of challenge to Marianne or to um, RFK on the Democratic ticket where he could probably get more publicity and doing it with a pretty discredited outfit like the People's Party. You know, not something that I personally would support under any really real stretch, but when it comes down to it, um, you know, when it comes down to it, I would really have to say that it is better to have somebody like Cornell West, who is an incredible speaker, incredibly knowledgeable, um, and somebody who can really defend his ideas well, and you know, very you know, just good, um, smart person, um, who can really get a crowd going and motivated. Uh, as well, and not to mention he's a very a scholar, you know, well, well, well respected um, among the black community, obviously. Uh, 
even though he did have some pretty direct criti- critiques of Obama, but he is running, and let's see what he had to say. In these bleak times, I have decided to run for truth and justice, which takes the form of running for president of the United States as a candidate for the People's Party. I enter in the quest for truth. I enter in the quest for justice. And the presidency is just one vehicle to pursue that truth and justice, what I've been trying to do all of my life. I come from a tradition where I care about you. I care about the quality of your life. I care about whether you have access to a job with a living wage, decent housing, women having control over their bodies, health care for all, the escalating, the destruction of the planet, the destruction of American democracy. Democracy creates disruption. It creates an eruption. It creates an interruption. Wide from below, the energies of everyday people is manifest. And I know there are precious people in your life who you care for. That's why it's important for you to be involved, important for you to participate. We're not talking about hating anybody. We're talking about loving. We're talking about affirming. We're talking about empowering those who have been pushed to the margins because neither political party wants to tell the truth about Wall Street, about Ukraine, about the Pentagon, about big tech. Neo-fascists like Brother Trump or milquetoast neoliberals like Brother Biden. Wow, I'm so happy to make a world-shaking decision. You know what I mean? Well, I know gangsters when I see them. <laughs> and gangster is not a subjective expression. It's an objective condition. Do we have what it takes? We shall see. But some of us are going to go down fighting, go down swinging with style and a smile, accenting the best in you and trying to tease out the best in me let's do it together i don't know i mean i feel like he just like he makes you smile like he's just someone who's just like happy he's got the right energy again he's a fighter for justice you know he's he's like you know we're not gonna win like come on but um we're gonna go down fighting which is something i completely respect um and it's not you know a lot of people will freak out about this for different reasons a lot of you know dsa type people will be like oh we should do it on the democratic side you know i personally think that's like you know it's a fair critique to make but to have somebody to vote, I, like voting for Cornell West for the first time in my life, um, will be an absolute honor. You know, it's something I'd be more than happy to do in New York, um, come twenty twenty four. You know, like that would be absolutely if you can get on the ballot. You know, that would be a pretty tough, pretty you know interesting thing to see if how we can do it. A test of the competency of the People's Party, but you know, I definitely think Cornell West is too good for the People's Party. But um, it is, he is not, you know, the People's Party is not bad enough for him to, you know, this to be decried and for him to not be in the race, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, Green, he said he's going to, um, fighting to end poverty, uh, mass incarceration, ending wars and ecological collapse, guaranteeing housing, health care, education, and living wages for all. Join the movement at CornellWest24.com. Calm. All right. So this is going to be a very interesting story to watch. You know, see if Cornell West gets up to anything you know, major in this campaign. It'd be interesting to see. Um, yeah, and hopefully it'd be, it'd be crazy if he really was to take off. And But I doubt, you know, he would have to really cut through a pretty intense media blackout in order to do it. All right. Let's go to... Our final story of the day. I like this one. It's pretty cool. You don't really, really get to do a lot of um, kind of really out there international stories because there normally is really a lot of uh, pressing things we have to talk about in the world of uh, just in the world of U.S. news and stuff like that. And normally, I like to go to the U.K. first because that's what I know most about. But um, pretty cool story out of Mexico. Um, 
The Mexico's oldest party has just lost control of the country's most populous and influential state, an election result that could signal the end of a powerful network that has dominated politics in the region for almost a century. Alejandro de, M- de Moral Vela, the candidate for incumbent in- for the incumbent Institutional Revolutionary Party, PRI, which has governed the state of Mexico, uh, not the country of Mexico, the state of Mexico. It's essentially saying, you know, if we had a province, you know, named America, that's what it would be like, or a state named America. Um, it would be like, it's essentially the province that goes around Mexico City. Um, and this guy, um, Moral Vela, Vela um, a PRI, lost and they have governed that the part, party PRI was is a pretty incredible party. Um, and kind of, I think it came to prominence in, in the wake of World War II um, in Mexico in the kind of thirties and pretty much governed, really built the country up. It was incredibly corrupt, um, especially when regards to the drug cartels in the seventies and eighties. You know, if there's pretty much any corrupt politician. You know, if you've if you've seen the show Narcos Mexico, if there's any which I highly recommend. By the way, um, a lot of people say oh, Narcos Colombia is the farthest you know. Narcos Mexico, 100%. Highly recommend. But if you have seen that show, pretty much every single corrupt politician in it is from the PRI. They govern Mexico uninterrupted from about 1930s, the, roughly the 1930s, to like the early 2000s. Like they were incredibly powerful, incredibly dominant. Um, but of course, they are not the party of Andres Manuel Lo- Lopez Obrador. Uh, who's the current president, one of the most successful, popular leaders, world leaders in the world, frankly. He's doing a very good job uh, keeping the large kind of rural and working class base in Mexico supporting him, as well as some of the more you know socially liberal uh, people in the cities. And one of those, Delfina Gomez, a former school teacher and mayor, a close ally of populist president, um, Andres Manuel, Lope- Manuel Lopez Obrador, AMLO, um, has won the governorship of the state of Mexico for the first time uh, for the party ever, and the beating PRI for the first time since 1929 uh, for the governorship of that state. It's a huge blow for the PRI here, according to The Guardian, which has clung to Edomex, which is its Spanish name, despite years of allegations of the foul play and despite losing every other state and the presidency in recent years. It marked an impressive victory for Morena, the party founded by AMLO, less than a decade ago. Gomez had consistently led in the polls, but in recent weeks, PRI claimed morale was closing the gap and had momentum. Last week, PRI was forced to defend its candidate after a joint investigation published by The Guardian revealed that at least $300 million had been embezzled by the state government through dozens of contracts awarded to front and shell companies between 2018 and 2022. Some of those contracts involved the Social Development Department, while led by Morrell, who canceled the final day of campaign events after the story broke. And by all accounts, this woman, Delfina Gomez, uh, won pretty handily in the state uh, for the party. I mean, it was like 53 to like 44 was like the final tally. So a pretty pretty solid win there for Moreno, the Moreno party, Amos party. Um, now the future of PRI is uncertain after Sunday's defeat, and the setback could improve insurmountable uh, when it comes to contesting the presidential elections next year, which is really pretty remarkable. Uh, the results on Sunday should have happened in 1999, but the PRI has managed to stay on track uh, an extra 24 years using electoral tricks, negotiations, and money. The outgoing governor, Alfredo Del Mazo Maza, secured a narrow victory in 2017 amid widespread allegations of fraud following in the footsteps of his grandfather, father, uncle, and cousin, Enrique Peña Nieto, who served as president between 2012 and 2018. These are the PRI family, essentially, that has been really institutionally corrupt in multiple cases uh, over the decades in Mexico. The family, which has governed NMX for a total of 29 years, are key players in the all. At La Comuco Group, a shadowy tribe of political and business power brokers that for years dominated the state and the country. Morrell represented an alliance between Mexico's three oldest mainstream parties, the PRI, um, the National Party of Action, uh, National Action Party, PAN, and the Party of Democratic Revolution, which hoped that they could come together to defeat Gomez and Morena. But voters signaled they were ready for change in the region, which was the most dangerous and unequal in Mexico. Voter turnout among the middle class, which PRI had been counting on, failed um, 
And according to Juan Carlos Villarreal Martinez, a political scientist at the Autonomous University of the State of Mexico and director of CEPLAN polling firm. It's the same set of strategy that has allowed them to lose more than 20 states since 2018. Damn. I think the party would have to change political direction in order to stand a chance in the 2024 elections, which they obviously have done many times in order to stay in power for you know nearly 100 years. But uh, people are fed up with the abuses, femicides, kidnapping, and the bad health system, and they're tired of the Atla com, 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 com Oh my goodness. Atla Comunco groups power which have manipulated the citizens through media and public institutions. People wanted real social programs, which helped the most marginalized social groups. After more than 90 years, the PRI is finally gone from the state of Mexico. Really incredible stuff right now. As you look at, I think it's now Morena controlling up to half of the states out of all of Mexico at this point, just by controlled by one party. And there again, there are about four kind of institutional parties in Mexico at the moment. So pretty cool thing to see and a great sign the institution, a country that's really been completely dominated by corrupt, you know, very United States associated, very wealthy people uh, for many, many years, pretty much the entirety of the 20th century um, now has a chance at building something different. And it's really cool uh, kind of area of the world that we will continue to pay very close attention to here on Newsflash so all the time we got for you guys today. Thank you so much for joining us here. We will see you on Wednesday. It's News Flash.